italiano y calor humano. Los quesos en casa tienen vitaminas rápidos de hacer. En cualquier cocina, tan fácil como pelar mandarinas. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. A lo que es su hermano, también que su opera. Costeño en matera, pay papel y suya. Y hasta doble crema. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Once again to my program, Ask the Cheese Doctor. Today we're giving the program number 20, I reckon. Yeah, and this program is dedicated to people who speak English uh, as a first language. English is not my first language. English is my second language. I speak Spanish, but anyway, I've been in New Zealand for the last eight years. And I, I developed this program and I made this channel and Dr. Quesero TV, where we teach how to make cheese, artists and cheeses. Um, if you guys speak English, come to my show every time you will be able to learn how to make cheese. Uh, I'm also part of uh, several Facebook books, uh, several Facebook groups, and I always post my my comments over there and invite people to come to my program. And, and I always speak about a topic. This I'm going to speak about coagulation. Okay, and I also I always answer the questions of my audience. But if you have any questions, just go here, come here, and make the question, and I will try to answer it. I hope I don't get flunk. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyway, as I said, today we're gonna speak about coagulation. But first of all, I want to make some announcement from a course, from a group. Um, I'm developing a um a webinar. How to make um, hand cheese? Hand cheese is a cheese that is like a and but using lactic cultures, which is which give a little bit more flavor than the, the express method with citric acid. And um, to make mozzarella, we have two methods: um, using acidifying with chemicals, which is lactic uh, lactic acid, citric acid, tartaric acid, vinegar, anything. Any type of acid that you put into the milk, and you get the right acidity. But we can also do this lactic culture. Lactic culture, as you know, produce in the lactic bacteria feed from the lactose of the milk and produce lactic acid. This lactic acid acid occurs, and it does the same effect. The thing is that by acidifying with lactic acid and with bacteria, the acid, the acid the bacteria all develop enzymes that give flavor more, more flavor to the cheese. So um, I'm going to make this course. Hand cheese is basically a mozzarella. If you want to make mozzarella, take this course and you will be able to make to make them the, the cheese. Okay? Because it's a pasta fila cheese. Or string cheese in English. Um <coughs> also, uh, all the my are given last Cheese, cheese. It's finished. It was a total success. My cheese was gorgeous with a lot of holes and stuff. I'm making more. I have it in my in the ripening box. So it's going to make a lot of holes. And my wife told me that it was very really young. And I want to thank to the new, to have two new members this week, which is Enrique Inciarte and Jose Gratero. These guys are speaks. I include an include one. If you, got, if you want to support the Channel so I can give more content and um, just a small amount, five dollars, three dollars, something like that per month, and you will be able to um, um, my, my content first than everyone else. Okay, but if you don't, if you don't, have and I'm gonna be posting the same the, the same videos and with the same love as always. Okay, um. My cheese course, my cheese course is almost ready. And I have two videos left for for, for the theor theoretical, okay? And then I have to make 
50 inches, which is going to be 15 more videos. So in summary, I have um, 17 videos left. And um, I have counted already. Yesterday, I counted. I, have, I already have made 20 videos, which don't work. And um, if you want to take this or just send me an email in English, of course, because we this is an email. And you can make um, ask the question. If you want to register into the course, go for it because um, it's worthy. You can learn not only to make fresh cheese, you'll be able to make any type of cheese in this. I'm going to have 15 videos into the course. Which we're gonna have fresh cheeses, we're gonna have Dutch cheeses, pasta filler cheeses, blue cheeses, um, much green cheeses. I mean, a lot of a lot of cheese that you that we're gonna make, and with this sort, of, you will be able to make cheese. And if you want to go further and make this art as a business, you will be able to do it. Okay. And um, someone here that it looks. I have to change my mic again. I, I, I thought it was, I reset my computer, but I'm going to change my, my mic. Or I can. Okay, thank you Roger for telling me. Okay. Uh, okay. This mic is it's a piece of shit. <laughs> okay, I hope you can, you can listen accordingly. Okay. Um, as I said, today we're going to speak about coagulation. I have the image, and we're going to speak. I'm going to tell you how coagulation works with my cheese. Okay. It's not only that. I mean, I want you to teach you the biochemical part in a simple way. I'm going to tell you in a simple way so you guys can understand. I'm not a biochemical, and neither a scientist. I'm just a cheese maker, but and I'm an engineer. So my my strength is math, but, but I have this knowledge in cheese making, and I want to share it with you in a simple way so you guys can understand. Okay. Okay. Um, let me share the screen so you guys can. And of course, after after the um, the presentation, I'm going to um, answer all the questions from my audience. By the way, I haven't said the um, our frontiers are still closed because of COVID. And I was planning to go to Australia for, for a master class in cheese. I will, uh, and also to Europe for to give a master class. But um, because the borders are closed, I'm going to have to postpone it for next year uh, until we solve the situation in COVID. Because if we come, um, but if we come back, we have to stay 15 days in isolation and in my queue which is a, in a hotel where you can go out for 15 days and you have to pay for it. And it's about grants, so for the whole family. So for that, we can't go out from New Zealand. We are just lucky. But anyway, um, also the International Cheese Award is um, when I reckon the registration is already closed. But if you want to compete, you still have the chance to the World Cheese Award which um, I'm also going to compete, um, but you have to be a registered cheese maker to go with. But anyway, if you don't, you're not a, a registered cheese maker, you just do it for fun, a hobby, and you want to participate in this tournament um, for next year, we're going to open again the tournament in the American Cheese Society, which is going to be. Um, on tournament next year and the international cheese award is going to be as well for next year and also the new zealand cheese award especially if you live in australia and you can next year is going to be more in may so you can go over there and compete okay let's go so everybody has things to do let's let's start with the pres with the presentation today we're going to get about let me share the screen Okay, okay. Now let's go. Well, I 
happen. This computer is very slow. Uh, okay. It's becoming very, very slow. Okay. <clears throat> As I said, when we make cheese, okay, before we make cheese, we have to coagulate the milk. And some people believe that the acidification of the cheese um, has something to do with the rennet that they use. This is a misunderstanding. Um, acidification doesn't have to do anything with coagulation. When we coagulate the milk, we use um, enzymes, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in a little while what type of enzyme that we use. But before that, in the Egyptian times, the, um, the, the, the human being, or the, the people that make cheese by that time, because cheese is a very ancient activity. It has more than 8,000 years. <coughs> so we've been making cheese since the um, Egyptians, okay? So, and they, because they realized that they could take their meal out from the cows or from the sheep and from the goats, and they could drink this milk or drink uh, and drink it. And also, um, e um, they realized as well <coughs> that they could preserve the milk by coagulating the, by coagulating. Um, but this is another story, okay? Um, so I'm going to teach you what happens during coagulation. When we coagulate the milk, first, in the milk we have proteins, which most of most of the protein that we use to make cheese is called casein. Okay? So as you may know, the milk is white. Why is it white? Because of the refraction of the light into the into the body of the milk. But it have is a uh, have Protein has a lot of type of proteins. The most important protein in milk is, is called casein. And these molecules, <coughs> these molecules of casein are floating into the milk and they don't attract each other. Why? Because um, these molecules of protein have on the outer layer, if you see this hairy... Uh, wait. Ah. Uh, okay. This hairy structure here. Uh, okay. If you see this hairy structure here, this hairy or these hairs are called, this is a type of protein called paracasein. Kappa casein, sorry. Kappa casein. This type of and these hair structures are charged with a negative charge. They're charged, they are charged negatively. Okay, so because they both of them have negative charge, they repel each other. And this is the reason why they don't get attracted. Okay, what happened? When we um, put the rennet, which is an enzyme, into the milk, what we are doing, shaving, literally shaving, the red shaves this hair, okay? So, because we don't have this hair anymore, the molecule of protein start to attract each other, okay? See? The hair start to cleave, okay? And they start to attracting each other. And this is the reason why the molecules of protein are attracting each other. This is the biochemical explanation why does it why it happens so um of course this type of enzyme that we use um is located into the stomach of the calf of the cows also of the goat and also i reckon the, um, the sheep as well or lamb um but nowadays we are making different artificially because uh, the process is more efficient. Um, ago, when we used to use the, 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 the stomachs of the calf, we used to dry, uh, kill the, ca the calf, 
the baby, the baby cow or the baby goat or the baby lamb. We used to kill him up, grab the stomach and dry dry them up, up into the sun. And then once they get dry, this this piece of meat of, of meat <coughs> of stomach have the enzyme that coagulates the milk, which is mostly uh, chemosine and, re and pepsin. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain you this in, in this in the next uh, screen. Um, but this process is very, I mean, can be affected by cross contamination because the cow um, or the or the or the stomach might be contaminated with E. coli or with, I mean, bacteria that can affect the the final product. Okay, so um, and so. We have to kill one, um, one half, and with this stomach, we only could get a certain amount of, let's say, pieces to coagulate, and the process is also very slow. So, the scientists and the manufacturers started to they started to producing this induced industrially, and and I'm gonna go over it in the next in the next week. Okay. <clears throat> how do we manage coagulation okay when we um, as i said because we were limited of caps calf stomachs we have to prepare this rennet artificially so the animal rennet um the companies have and they use the the, the stomach of the calf and they grind it in the kind of animal rennet, and which is 90% chemosin and 10% pepsin. Chemosin is an enzyme, pepsin is another type of enzyme. But they also realized that they could have the same effect by using plants, by using certain molds. One mold that we use to, um, to coagulate the milk is the mucor mehe is a type of mold so this type of mold is the best uh, is what we use for vegetable rennet. when we make cheese we can use vegetable rennet or animal rennet the vegetable rennet is for best um, for vegetarians can be also used by people who eat meat <coughs> i have used both of them. i have used vegetable rennet and the rennet that comes from the mold and or the vegetable rennet is the one that we call microbial rennet okay and from the animal source is called animal rennet but also and this is the most effective one the scientists have realized that they could manufacture um the, the rennet by modifying the adn or recombine the adn Okay, this is wrong. It's not A and D, it's A D N. So um it's a genetically modified uh, we have only hundred percent of chemosine. Chemosine from the animal running source. So they modify the cells and this is the one that we use mostly in okay. Of course, if you are using I, I have used I use the three of the three of them, but um the fermented rennet is the most common one and i reckon it will be the, the cheapest okay so how to manage the coagulant when we when we use rennet we have to put a certain amount of coagulant what type of how much do we have to put well each manufacturer has a dose the dose to use and they give you like a band a lower a lower band and an upper band what i do is i always go in this in the middle use the center to put an example if they talk if they, if they say to put one gram between one and five grams per thousand liters to put an example and you can use 2.5 which is the the value from the from the middle but you can also go and use the um, the lower amount the lower band what happened <clears throat> if we put too much rennet your cheese will become bitter. and that's not very good this is a defect especially in competition and 
any client might feel it and they would they would, and you will have, you're gonna have complaints so how to use rent it use the amount um recommended by the supply but it's your decision to go to the lower band to the upper band or to the center or maybe you can go one third doesn't matter it's your decision but you have to dilute and this is what i put the word dilution you have to dilute it um, in the in the concentration of 10 times why because if we <coughs> generally this one comes in powder or liquid and if you put, for example, yeah, these amounts are very small. To put an example, for 30 liters of milk, you can put maybe half a gram or maybe less. And to put half a gram into 30 liters of milk to spread all the rennet, it's going to be very complicated because you're, especially if you put the powder into the milk, the powder might get, might start caking. And if they start caking, it's not going to be spread enough. Um, in, um, uh, it's not going to be spread sufficiently. And therefore, um, the coagulation process will start, it won't start evenly. So the idea is to dilute it in 10 times the amount that you put. If you put half a gram, okay? If you put half a gram, you um, use five milliliters of water. If you put a little bit more, it doesn't matter. Okay, but in general terms, you have to put 10 times the amount that you put. And this is to make it more spreadable. And how to mix it? When you put them the rennet into your milk, um, this action is gonna be really fast. So um, if you put too much rennet, as I said, it's gonna become bitter, but your coagulation is gonna start as well very fast. And sometimes you don't have if you put too much, you will, um, after you put it and start stirring, the milk will might or might get coagulated instantaneously. So um, you have to give time. And the mixing times in general terms is one minute. I would say no more than uh, 75 seconds, no more than that. Because after the minute, the milk, the, the enzyme will start coagulating your milk. Um, so mix for one minute and then you have to let it set for the for the rennet to um to coagulate the milk. How much how long do you have to wait for that? In general terms, you have to wait for between 45 minutes or one hour to give time the to the rennet to react and to coagulate the milk. The rennet, what it does is, as I said, because the molecule, the, the kappa casein the kappa casein molecule, they shave them off from the middle, and they produce the um, this um, the the electric charge will change, and the molecules of, of casein will start to attract each other. Okay. Um, what factors affect the effectivity of the rennet? First of all, when we use rennet and mix it with water, this water should be without chlorine, okay? Which we have to be non-chlorinated water. Why? Because the chlorine um, take the effectivity, reduce the effectivity of the rennet. To put an example, if you use chlorine solution, at only two parts per million, which is nothing because the the for, for sanitizing is 200 parts per million. So if you use rennet for uh, uh, with only two parts per million of chlorine concentration, it will reduce 40% of the activity of the rennet in three minutes. So what you should do and what I do is I just use the rennet just right before I'm going to coagulate my milk. Okay, I, what I do is heat the milk, put the bacteria, ripen the milk for one hour to give time for the bacteria to wake up. And after the hour, I prepare my, I prepare my, my rennet solution and start stirring the milk and then put, put the rennet. Don't put the rennet first and 
start uh, steering because you're gonna lose time. You're gonna waste time. Start steering, and then when you put the rennet, the 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 liquid is moving, is move is moving, and there and it will be spreading um, evenly. Okay. So um, this is what I do. Um, don't let the rennet just stay there for five minutes because you're gonna lose 70, 80 percent of the effectivity. And when you put into the mill, your rennet is not gonna work. And it's gonna put your mill beater or your cheese beater because you're gonna have to put more rennet again to coagulate the same mill. So um, try to do it just before you're going to coagulate your milk. Okay. Five parts per million of chlorine solution of chlorine uh, of water solution will lose effective uh, sixty percent of the effectivity in three minutes. So it's very important to use non chlorinated water. However, if you're if you, what because it, it sometimes you have to be pragmatical. Sometimes you forget uh, you forget to have chlorinated water. How do you chlorinated water? Instead of you can do two things. Instead of buying it from the supermarket, which is this bottle of water which has no chlorine, but it's, uh, it's vacuum packed or uh, it's packed and very, uh, sec, um, very um, uh, as, um, sanitized. Um, what I do is you can boil water okay, and the heat will denature the chlorine. So you can use boiled water as non as non chlorine solution as non chlorine water non chlorine water and it will work but what i do because sometimes i forget to do that right, is i know that my chlorine is going to reduce my effectivity so what i do is i use chlorine solution or chlorine water but um instead of working in the low band i work in the center value as i said if I if the volt is, is the, my lower band says one gram per thousand liters, and the other one and the upper band says five grams per thousand liters, I use two point five, which is the center value. By the center value, and I know that in three minutes it go, is going to lose effectivity. What I do is because I prepare maybe hundred liters, two hundred liters. What I do is start steering and use the center value with chlorinated water which is easier and start steering so i know that by use by choosing the center value my rna still will have effectivity and will probably email accordingly okay uh, okay another factor that affect the coagulation time is the ph at the age 5.4 and 5.38 the curd agglutinates more quickly and this is the ideal pH for cheese making okay. however each recipe have their own values for example you're gonna make fresh cheeses don't wait until you have 5.4 pH into your milk because your curd is gonna get too wet so I'm talking about the um, the ideal pH for the rennet to work. It doesn't mean that you have to um, you have to have this value on your milk of, of this pH value on your milk to coagulate. So um, what, uh, normally when we coagulate the milk, we get pH six point something, six point four, six point five, and this is the this is the pH that we normally have when we're going to, when we are coagulating the milk, especially if we are making fresh cheeses. And also if we are making mozzarella as well, you don't have to wait for the for the pH to its values. Another factor that affects coagulation is temperature. The coagulation rate is faster at temperatures between 43 and 44 degrees. Okay. Temperature above 44 degrees, you will make your curd more rubbery. Why? Because the heat will make the curd to expel away and will become more compact. And therefore, because at the early stage of the coagulation, your curd has a lot of calcium. And this calcium will make your curd rubbery. So we have to, if we're going to make, for example, cheese, we have to allow the, the acid 
from the bacteria to sol uh, to the nature the soluble calcium so we have we can have a right acidity and a right level of calcium of soluble calcium into your core so we have um okay um in this way your curd will not become so rubbery but if you're making cheese for example like um halloumi halloumi cheese is a cheese that has a lot of calcium it's a fresh cheese and it's rubbery the curd is rubbery the and um all this cheese to make halloumi if you want to know how to make i have a video of how to make halloumi in my channel and you can go and um, make this type of cheese is very yum of course it's rubbery but this is the nature of the cheese and we have to boil it at 85 degrees which is more than 44 and this is how i say that it would become rubbery okay another another factor that affect the the um, the coagulation time of the cheese is the casein fat ratio the lower the casein fat ratio the weaker and less firm your core will be how we know the fat casein ratio well normally um, um, in general terms if we put more fat into our milk remember that this is a um, a division right this is a division here the casein is, is in the denominator. The bigger the denominator, the less the number. So if we put more fat here, reduce the lower casein value or the lower casein ratio, and therefore our our curve will become weaker. So we have to um, uh, we have to play with this number. Okay. The type. So, and this fat casein ratio is used. When, mostly when we are using standardized milk. When, what, what I mean by standardized milk. Standardized milk is the milk that we can take fat from it or we can put fat to the milk. How do we take fat from the milk? Um, we mix the milk with, we, we mix our milk with skin milk, with low fat milk. And of course, we're gonna have a bigger volume with less fat. If we want to, if we increase, if we want to increase uh, to make the the um, our milk more creamy or creamier, we put fat on it. What do we do? We add cream to the to the same milk. To put an example, if we have ten liters of milk at three point four percent fat, to put an example, and we put one liter of milk, this milk will not become three point four. A percentage 3.3.4 percent fat anymore it will be higher okay how do we calculate these numbers i have a, a, a video in my channel uh, how to standardize the milk go go to it have a look and i will explain i, I explain you over there how is the procedure to do that we use a um, something that we call that we call the pearson square that we uh, this is how what we use to um, to standardize the milk. It's a very easy calculation. You have to follow a procedure, and you can get milk five percent, seven percent, ten percent. It depends of the calculation. Okay. You also can <coughs> instead of adding increasing the fat percent. As I said before, it will lower your casein ratio, your casein fat ratio, and therefore your 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 curve will, will become weaker. You can make a, 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 a low fat cheese, let's say 2% fat cheese. What we do is we add, instead of adding cream, we add skim milk. And therefore, we use um, we get this type of, of cheeses with low fat. Okay. Another, another factor that affects the rennet effectivity is the level of calcium into the milk. Okay, um, level of two hundred grams per thousand liters will increase the firm the firmness of the of the rennet, okay, and the speed of coagulation. Also, if we use phosphoric acid, we, we're going to have the same effect. So, when you uh, in general terms, when we are using calcium, try to use 
um, 30% calcium solution, calcium chloride solution. And what I uh, what I suggest uh, what I suggest you guys to do is to use 0.5 milliliters or half a milliliter per liter of milk. Which means if, if you are using if you to for example 10 liters of milk of, uh, of yeah 10 liters of milk use five milliliters of calcium at 30% uh, concentration. Okay, this is more or less the, um, the parameter that you have to use. Okay, um, when we use calcium chloride, we use we always use 30% solution. Um, in this with this parameter, you have a liter, a liter of milk. Okay, and your your um, coagulation time become reasonable, and you're gonna have a decent curd. We use this type of of um, chemical we use calcium chloride normally when we use, when we are using pasteurized milk because in pasteurizing in pasteurizing when we pasteurize the milk we lose fifteen percent of the calcium content of the milk. Okay. Um, another factor that affect coagulation is the quality of milk. If we have milk with mastitis our milk will become more alkaline and therefore um, we're going to have reduced firmness in the curd. And we're going to have to wait longer to get the, the um, decent curd. So in general terms, we, we cannot use milk that uh, we can have milk and that, uh, that have antibiotics because milk with mastitis is pretty much milk that has antibiotics so if this milk is not allowed it's not it's not good because it has um, by having mastitis the, the cow by having mastitis you're gonna have a white globules into the into the in, into the milk they're gonna pass to the cheese i mean you're not gonna have a good product Okay, so try to avoid this type of milk. And if you if your cows are having mastitis, don't use this milk. Just um, get some milk. This milk, dump it or give it to the to the calf. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't I'm not. I'm not a farmer, but I would say don't use this milk. And once your milk, once your cows are cured, you can use this type of milk. Um, as a note, the raw milk temperature history is another factor that you also have to consider when the milk is stored for a long period of time, okay, at low temperature, the clotting time or the milk time of your of your milk will increase, and this effect is reversely, is reversed or is reversed by heating the milk, okay. Prolonged cooling time of the milk will decrease coagulation speed. Okay, if you cool your milk too much into the tank, the coagulation time will um, will decrease. Okay, and one note that I want to tell you is if you use a bad milk, for example, a milk that is going to expire, for sure you get cheese. So um, if you use good milks. And you know how to make cheese? For sure, you're gonna have a good cheese because you're using fresh cheese, fresh milk. But if you have a bad product, a bad raw material like a, bad, a, a rotten or a, an expired milk, old milk, you for sure have a bad cheese, a good and not, and not a good quality one. So, when you, by making cheese, try to make your try to use the milk as fresh as possible because in this way, you there's a guarantee if you know how to make cheese. Then you're gonna have a good product, but if you use rubbish as a raw material, a rubbish cheese, a rubbish milk, for sure you're gonna have a bad product. So, and your clients are going to complain. Okay. And um, the another factor that affects the coagulation time or the renin is the pasteurization. Okay. If you heat your milk too much, okay, you're going to the, um, you're going to denature the calcium phosphate in your in your milk. Therefore, your your curd will become 
weak. That's the, and that's the reason why we use calcium. Because sometimes the, the, the people who, especially if you go, if you buy milk from the supermarket, which is always pasteurized. Um, if, you, if you use milk from the supermarket like I do, okay, because I don't, I don't buy past, uh, raw milk, and I always put calcium chloride. And sometimes these companies over pasteurize the milk, okay? Because they do it industri industrially and they over pasteurize it. And in this way, sometimes you get your chlor, which is weak because, and, and if you, you know, you, 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 you can talk to your supplier, hey, you are over pasteurizing the milk, please, and you can complain. If we over pasteurize your milk, you can, ref uh, as I said, you're gonna lose some calcium that you can replace by adding calcium chloride, but the, the nature of the whey protein, you can do something, anything about it. It is the nature, you can recover it, okay? So um, in this way, well, what you can do is if, if you heat the meal too much, your, your, your protein is gonna be the nature, and in your worst case scenario, you're gonna get a recover, even though if, they, if you put calcium chloride, chloride okay? So, be vigilant with your pasteurization time if you are using raw, raw milk and don't heat your milk more than 60 degrees, more than 70 degrees, sorry. Okay? And temperature above, above 60 will ultra pasteurize your milk and therefore will denature your, your protein. Okay? The loss of soluble, of soluble calcium, as I said, can be compensated. That's right. And the effect of whey protein cannot be reversed back. Okay, you're gonna get weak curves. You're gonna in, you're gonna have to. Um, you can do anything about it. Okay, and, you, and as I said, in your work case scenario, you're gonna get weak curves. Okay. Yeah. Fourteen, fifteen questions for the audience. But if you have any questions, just ask me, and I will be very pleased to answer your questions here. Okay. Let me close this. So we can have more memory for the computer. My computer is very slow. I don't know why. It's very slow today. Hello. Your first, this is your friend here. And of course I take questions, yeah. I hope I can answer them, all of them. Um, if you, um, thank you. For coming, I'm very pleased to have you here. Let me remove my presentation. Okay. Yeah, give me a shoot. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to start with my audience here. Uh, Roger Gonzalez, uh, he says uh, he's speaking Spanish. Roger, this is an uh, English channel. If you want to come to my um, program, it's at 10 o'clock New Zealand time. But you're more welcome here to be here. Okay, so don't worry. My audience, uh, wait, uh, it says here, <coughs> an avid yogurt maker. I've kept the homemade yogurt going for close, for close two years, two, three years. It keeps getting a deeper and more complex flavor as time goes by. My question is, can you make yogurt totally out of heavy cream? Well, look, this is a question, and I'm gonna, tell you my, I'm gonna give you my opinion. When we use lactic culture, okay, we have to allow the lactic bacteria to feed from the lactose and produce lactic acid and doesn't have to do anything with it, okay? And if you, you add fat to your yogurt, a, a, a yogurt with more fat, which doesn't have to do anything with the, with the, the ripening of the yogurt. To, um, you could do it if you want to make a creamy yogurt. You could do it. But the you use yogurt as a source of lactic 
a source of culture. This is the only reason why you are using yogurt, not to the fat content, the fat content group the flavor. When you are making cheese or yogurt or any dairy, you have to relate um, fat with flavor because there is a process called, there is a process into the dairy product or cheese making process in yogurt as well. The lipolysis. The lipolysis is the, the nature of the fat content. The more proteolysis you have in your product, the more it also happens with the protein the more and the more uh, there is a process called proteolysis the, and proteolysis is associated with texture lipolysis is associated with flavor. you have both processes into your milk into your yogurt as well so if you want to use um cream in your yogurt you can do it okay you're gonna have a cream product And with the product, I mean, the yogurt is the source of the bacteria. That's it. You can use as well. You can make your adding cream to your milk, and you see lactic culture. Using to put an example, the 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 what do you call it? the the I don't know. I don't know how to say it in English. The, Lafilize, and Hano. I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna tell you in gen, in in the scientific method. You have you can to, you can put the lactobacillus into your milk with your cream, and you are because you are bacteria from the from the supplier. If you don't have this type of bacteria, you of but cream doesn't have to do anything with the yogurt. If you if you if you don't open your 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 yogurt is closed, your bacteria is gonna dormant. It's not gonna, um, okay. When you okay, it will, it will wake up and start producing lactic acid. You you might, you still have some lactose into your yogurt. The thing is that if you open your yogurt. And when you use it, the cell that you produce will kill him sooner or later. So you have to use your yogurt in, um, um, quickly. You know, you, you can try the, the yogurt for three or, 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 or ten weeks. No, because eventually this lactic acid will kill your, your, your bacteria. Okay? So if you want to make a creamy yogurt, use milk. Cream, and if you want to use, you can use it. Or I would, I would, put, I would use the um, the lactic culture from the supplier. This is what I do. Okay, I hope I have answered your question. Okay. Wait. <clears throat> Another question. I know this is called Payan. Ah, but this is in Spanish. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> I know here. So, <coughs> Scott, help. My cheddar is drying and developing a rind. I was going to wax it today, but I see mold on top. Google says to cut it away. But I really don't think I should in this stage. What's the method to remove it? Salt, wi salt wipe? Uh, Ido for what? Well, look. The, the mold in the cheddar cheese is not a biggie. Okay? You can have, you can have um, mold. Yeah, of course. A small amount is not, it's not a biggie. Try, if you want to wax it, Try to have mold on the top. It's because the mold, your wax is not going to attach properly, and then have contamination in in, in between the rind, between the rind, 
the wax later. So you're gonna have this 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 mold and, and you want to attack accordingly. So clean it. Try to clean it. You can scrap it up a little bit, doesn't matter. Of course, don't go to it. And, and try and what I do, I wash it either with salt solution, brands with brand solution, or I use vinegar solution. I use a dump um I make a solution with a little bit of water and and I clean the cheese. Okay. And I use a cloth and don't I don't use don't the same part of the cloth, for example, if you use your cloth. Wax it in this area and then if you again if you want to clean it again, just grab another end. So you always have a clean end to take them all out. To take them all out. And the vinegar solution, what it does is toy the mold. Once it's clean, let it dry maybe for five hours. Okay. By washing it, you can both ways. You can paint the cheese with the water, or you can soak it into the into into the wax. But of course, you're gonna depending on the type of cheese, you're gonna need a big amount of wax. Yeah. And what I do, I, the finishing are very good. When you make a brush, give you the marks. So the best way is soak it twice. Full soak it, let it dry for maybe um, one minute, and then change a bit by the area, boom, and soak the other end. Let it for five minutes. When it gets really, it gets hard, and then do it again twice. Okay, don't do it too many times because your layer of wax is going to be too. Too thick, and if you um, if you um, clean you and have no more, the wax will attach accordingly and come off. Okay. Hi, now welcome to my channel. My channel is always come to me. Oh, thank you for coming here. Um, she has a question here. Uh, let's see. Hi. How are you, Dr. Cheese, Dr. Casero? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming here. You have a problem in the mic. Uh, yes, I have a problem. I, I just change it. I just change the mic. Um, I hope I don't. Um, let me know if I'm having problems again. I change the mic. This was the old one. I changed for an old, the, the one that I always have. So, um, you know, if you're having, please comment here. I would appreciate you. you have problems again with my mic. Um, I hope not, because I am, yeah. I reckon I'm okay now. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to check again. This is the first time. I have a question. Um, Eric says here, let me see if I have some. Ah, uh -huh. uh, uh, I have a question here. Hi, doctor. Good, uh, good afternoon. I understand that we have to control temperature, but what happens if my temperature of my milk raise uh, several degrees above? Process. Uh, what, and for the for those who make cheese at home, they don't have the infrastructure to maintain. Um, this is in Spanish. I'm translating. Um, as the as the big companies. Um, ah, you're talking about pasteurization. Um, talking about the thirty minutes pasteurization time um is it good to keep the temperature between 33 and 36 degrees during this time is it rise with this temperature yes or not well look to pasteurize you have to follow a protocol to pasteurize you have to follow a protocol this protocol is to heat the temperature at 60 i mean you have to, you can use several combinations one for half an hour. Two. 
control. If you don't have a thermometer, you have the baby's use. As long as you have a way to, um, to measure your temperature. 30 minutes and heat the milk at 30 degrees Celsius. Leave it in this. You can start increasing In my about pasteurization, I show the different levels of temperature. Go to my video and you can have a look and it will tell you. Milk heated at 6 or 30 is you don't con it's not considered pasteurization. So you have to try especially if you are making fresh cheese. If you're making fresh cheese, you completely have to pasteurize your milk. If you're using if you're making fish cheese like cheddar, like um a party. Asiago, I mean, any cheese that is ripening for or is, is being aged for more than six raw milk because the aging time will give time to the for the bacteria to die because the cheeses start getting, start losing moisture and the low level of moisture eventually will kill the bacteria. Okay, so um. But it's your, it's your decision as a cheesemaker. If you if you want to ripen cheeses, you can, you can use raw milk, and of course, excellent. It's gonna be awesome if you make ripe cheeses or aged cheeses above sixty days raw milk. But if you make fresh cheeses, my advice: use pasteurized milk because you can sick or you can get sick your family or your clients. Okay, so you have to be very careful. And then you're gonna have complaints if you're making, for example, if you're making mozzarella with raw milk, because some people do that, by heating the milk, by sorry, by heating the curd, I'm sorry, by, by making the mozzarella with raw milk, it's gonna be pasteurized. No, that's not totally true. You might have part of the curd pasteurized because you are applying heat, but some area, some areas of your will not get. You have to be careful with it because you can get your client sick or you can have you can get your family sick. So okay. my advice always pause the when you are making fresh cheeses. Okay. okay. I hope I have answered your question. Okay. Angel or Angel is asking, is it necessary to wax the cheese? Okay, look. Um, remember, you're the cheeser. It's not necessary to wax the cheese. You can vacuum the cheese. The, the, the idea of waxing is to avoid the cheese from losing moisture. If you um, vacuum pack, you it will not lose moisture. It will not gain more. What happens if you are making, for example, if, um, especially if you are making cheese for a competition? The waxing process is, is the um, process that the monks, the blades, used to use. Okay, and now by using wax, you use your personal touch to the cheese. So, um, and you can. The color of the wax, you can use red wax, black one, or yellow wax, and it will give the cheese your personal touch. Um, it's not compulsory, but remember, cheese making is an art. Besides, a job is also an art. By putting wax, you can even make the color on one side and the other color of the wax on the other side. It's your touch. See, so um, I haven't, I never done it, <laughs> but um, by putting what, by using what you're giving the personal touch to your product. So I would say, I would say, use it, yeah. but it's not, it's not compulsory. 
Okay. If you're making cheese as business, eventually you can vacuum back your cheeses. You have to let, allow them to dry. And then once it's get dry, pull back them and put it to the fridge for ripening. And or for aging for three, four, five, six months, depending on the because you're not gonna compete in anything. Or you know you you don't you, you don't care about people like uh, watching the kind of the cheese of the of the of, yeah the, the external part of the cheese you don't care about it but if you are selling a cheese that, and for example a good cheese that have the the, the because the, the, the wax the, the wax cover is part of the personal uh, is, is part of the nature of the cheese okay so you can use a one uh, Adri said so it means that the raw milk is the one directly from the cow. Well, yes, take long in this question because it's obvious. Um, yeah, raw milk is called is the one that comes from the cow directly from the from the over of the cow. Uh, Ender, he says here, Ender, I'm trying to make Siete Cueros cheese, but the cheese gets very hard, like mozzarella. What can I do? Well, look, Siete Cueros is a cheese from Mexico, okay? Siete Cueros cheese is a cheese Mexico. It's called Oaxaca cheese. However, the from Oaxaca said that the Oaxaca cheese is the Oaxaca cheese and there's no other name because or denomination of origin. Anyway, <coughs> it's more like all of these types of cheeses are mozzarella. Okay? Secueros, eh, quesillo, Oaxaca, all of your mozzarella got really got hard. How to avoid that? You can do and put it in water a little bit. Put it in water with calcium chloride, okay? Because if you if you put it with calcium chloride, you might get a a, a, a blurry, not blurry, a, a slimy curd. At the end, if you leave it too much in the into the brand, uh, into the water without calcium chloride, your curd will become slimy, okay? Because it will get hydrated too much on the on the others so put it into a brand solution of maybe 10 percent brand solution with calcium chloride okay the concentration of calcium chloride is pretty much 0 0.5 percent of calcium chloride in this way your cheese or your, your mozzarella won't lose calcium okay and um, it will absorb the water from the from the from the uh, from the container that you put it because it's hard because it's dehydrated. So you have to allow the curd to hydrate a little bit and um, uh, uh, oh, time's over. We have one hour. Gee, well, one more question. That's it. Uh, <clears throat> Ray Alvarez he says here I use vinegar to make mozzarella but it didn't work out I don't know what happens but the milk didn't curdle and I follow all your steps well um, I have a video in my channel how to make hen cheese which is a mozzarella basically with vinegar <coughs> okay what happens if your milk didn't curdle? If the milk didn't, um, because when, uh, this process is you have to heat the milk at 55 degrees. The vinegar. And um, sorry, that's not the way. You have to put your vinegar first with the milk cold degrees Fahrenheit. And heat them up all together vinegar and milk, 55. Degrees. At 55 degrees, the temperature instantaneously will cover the milk. 
um, it will allow them um, the casein to to stick to other. If you didn't achieve this this uh, effect, is because your milk is ultra processed. If your milk is ultra processed or is um, UHT milk, which is a temperature um, above 130 degrees, um, I'm thinking about the pasteurization process. Your molecule of casein, your, your protein is all denatured. What you're going to get is ricotta the in, the, in, the in the best case scenario. So, um, what do you have to do? Change the milk to make mozzarella on, on this type of cheese, which is basically mozzarella. If you use non homogenized milk, it's a different story. I'll tell you. Um, don't use homogenized milk because if you use homogenized milk, you're not going to make uh, this pasta cheese. Okay? So, um, it's milk, and for sure, you're going to have, you're going to get a, a good result. Okay? Well, um, that's all, folks. Uh, thanks for coming, Gregory. Gregory, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, Roger, thank you for coming. Uh, Manal, thank you for coming. And you guys, thank you for coming. The other ones that are going to see, that are, see me, that can see me, uh, or can watch me um, during this schedule, they always watch the product in my show for hours. Thank you for coming. Um, spread the voice that exists. I always am here every Saturday. My, my, the link for my show every Saturday in my in, the, in my Facebook groups. I have I am going to a lot of favorites. If you want to learn how to make cheese the correct way, come to my program because and if you have any, any doubts, just come here. Gregory didn't ask. I expected you to shoot something for me. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the same love for you guys. And um that it is because life without cheese is like a love without a kiss. Um, see you next week. And Quesitos I hope you casa, come back again. Bye. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fácil es de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesos colombianos y venezolanos, todo hecho en tu casa con sabor.